Welcome back to the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. We've got a very special guest for you today. We have Matt Burke, who is the founder and CEO of Fairway America and Veravest. You may have heard his name before. He's been in the private alternative and real estate space for several decades. He's a seasoned real estate executive, chief investment officer, fund manager, multi-decade career. He successfully managed over 11 different real estate funds. And we're going to dive into his extensive background just in the industry, exploring the evolution of this business of private real estate. He shares a lot of very valuable insights that he's gained over the past several decades and uh, giving our listeners a really unique perspective of someone who's been around for a long time and has seen the evolution of this industry. So tune in. You're going to really enjoy this episode as we uncover kind of his story. We'll let him to get into this space and all the knowledge that he's gained over the past several decades. So you're not going to want to miss this. Hope you enjoy. This is the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast, where we uncover the alternative investments and strategies that billionaires use to grow wealth. The tools and tactics you'll learn from this podcast will make you a better investor and help you build legacy wealth. Join us as we dive into the world of alternative investments, uncover strategies of the ultra wealthy, discuss economics, and interview successful investors. Looking for passive investments done for you? With Aspen Funds, we help accredited investors that are looking for higher yields and diversification from the stock market. As a passive investor, we do all the work for you, making sure your money is working hard for you in alternative investments. In fact, our team invests alongside you in every deal so our interests are aligned. We focus on macro-driven alternative investments so your portfolio is best positioned for this economic environment. Get started and download your free economic report today. Welcome back to another episode of the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. I am your co-host, Ben Frazier, joined by fellow co-host, Jim Mafuccio. And today, uh, we're very excited to have as our guest, Matt Burke. Uh, Matt is the founder and CEO of Fairway America and Veravest. And he's uh, been uh, doing this for a good amount of time. So he's been a seasoned real estate executive, chief investment officer, fund manager, He's managed over 11 different real estate funds um, over 22 years. And so, Matt, really excited to have you on and just kind of bring your kind of breadth of experience um, to our listeners and just sharing your insights over what you've seen over the past 20 years. So give us a little bit of background on on how you kind of got started in the business. And I know your business has evolved, you know, uh, quite a bit over time. So maybe share just some of the the story here. Sure. So ben, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, I started out in real estate finance, uh, sort of by accident coming out of college and learned real estate and finance and, and you know, all that goes along with those things, uh, almost by happenstance, kind of really enjoyed the real estate piece. Uh, moved around to a few, uh, banks and thrifts and thrift and loans back in the day and then ended up starting my own company in the late, uh, early nineties, 1992. And, uh, you know, kind of took a, took a pass to get here, but we, we did, uh, commercial real estate, uh, loan brokerage in the early days and eventually started our first fund in the late nineties, 99, 2000, we launched our first fund and that kind of started me off down a path of, of fund management that coming out of the great recession, we kind of got into more of a coaching and advisory role, helping other managers get set up and kind of one thing led to another. So. I guess and with the benefit of hindsight, it's always interesting to see how, you know, twists and turns that your life and your career and your business take. But um, yeah, I guess if you're around long enough, you know, you do a lot of different things. I, I love it because one of the cool things that uh, you've kind of evolved your business into is you're really serving kind of both investors where you have your own funds where you're still managing those, although you've kind of um, you know, graduated, so to speak, or kind of moving up the food chain to more institutional money. But you also have a business that serves fund managers. So you do administration, you do coaching, you help set up funds and syndication. And so you're really in this, this cool place where you see the perspectives of both. And I think have a really unique perspective to share you know, with our listeners who are mostly passive investors. But before we get there, I'd, I'd love to hear, you said you lost your first fund in 1999. And so this was before the Jobs Act, right? And and it's, it's so fascinating to me to hear what it was like back then, because a lot of people are in the space now well, have been doing it a couple of years, right? And so they yeah. don't have the benefit of, of that long perspective. So what was it like in 99 launching a fund? I mean, it's just so curious. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, 
all the things that people take for granted now there you know there was no jobs act there was no public solicitation and advertising right everything was a b uh, now there was it wasn't called a b because there was no b and c it's just it was all the same and you know you couldn't publicly solicit and advertise you had to have a prior business relationship with all of your investors uh and there was ways to do that so you know it was pretty old school i think and i would say we built our investor base largely one investor at a time one referral at a time you know kind of from the inside out rather than you know being able to do social media and podcasts you know things like we're doing today it was kind of a different world but you know the vast majority of our investors were from the area um and then you know it was a lot of really word of mouth and and one investor leading to another uh which i still think works really well today right i mean it's it's always easier to transfer trust from people that already know and trust you to to other people that that also can so uh, in some ways it's not all that different but i think the way in which people market now and and you know do things to try to generate new investors that has changed a great deal yeah uh, that's so interesting so in you said after the great recession you shifted more towards kind of coaching consulting with the fund managers or when was that transition that kind of kind of happened for you yeah it was i, I mean what happened well i had a, a fairly good sized fund it was about 80 million bucks in uh 2008 through uh, you know really and all the way prior to the great recession we launched that in late 07 which is my fourth fund and then we that was the first fund that i ever really used leverage so we had a large we had a 50 million dollar line of credit that had a three-year term on it and with with the banks not really wanting to be in that business anymore in 2011 and even though we met every covenant made every payment had every you know had crazy good cash flow coverage and everything else they just wanted out of the business you know across the board so they failed to renew the line which forced me to have to wind down that fund that was the first time i ever had to wind a fund down and that whole experience uh yeah everybody it's like the I would say when people set up a fund, they, everybody's optimistic and, you know, of course they're going to grow it and so forth. And nobody really thinks about, you know, what's going to happen three or four or five or 10 years from now when I actually have to wind this down, let's say in a not very good market. Right. So as my securities lawyer put it at the time, then he's like, Matt, you now have your PhD in fund management, you know, because I had to wind that thing down. And as we were winding it down, ironically, you know, the bulk of our income was tied to, you know, deal fees and asset management. The fund management fees. Well, if your mission is to wind the fund down and your primary source of income is the management fees off of that fund, you're kind of in a position where, okay, I'm basically working myself out of a job, right? So we had to decide at that point then, you know, what is the next iteration of what we're going to do? And and I'd say, coincidentally, I had four or five real estate people that I knew who came to me during that time period and said, hey, Matt, I know you know a lot about funds, you know, you Build, you've done several and you've managed them and I'm thinking about setting up a fund. Now, what do, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? How should I do this? How should I do that? And while we were in the process of winding the fund down, you know, and lowering our income, it occurred to me that there are a lot of people out there like I was who, when you first set up the fund, you really don't know, you don't know what you don't know. And there's, a, it's just, it's very difficult to launch and set up a fund from scratch and Back then, and even today, for the most part, the only real option a manager has to get that guidance is, is security lawyers. And mm -hmm. security lawyers are, they're great, they're important, but they're they are only one spoke in the wheel of fund management. I mean, they, you know, and, and look, and if you don't have that spoke or the spoke is off, the wheel doesn't turn. So you need, well, but it's not the hub, it's the spoke, it's a spoke, right? But there's there's capital raising and asset management and investor relations and and accounting and legal and all of those things have to you know factor into each other. So, and the long story short, Ben, it's not too late already. Is we, I yeah, I started saying, hey, there's a real business to be had here by helping people, you know, understand what it's like to set up a fund to do it properly in the first place. Because if you set it up right, you match your asset model to your to your uh, capital structure, you just stand a way better chance. And I think that's what launched uh, what is now, you know, we've since then done, I don't even know how many funds, three, 400, that we've played the lead role in helping managers all over the country architect that that fund. And there's always Securities Council is still involved, right? But, but we help them think through 
and set it up properly to give them the best chance of success in the first place. And that's kind of the the core product that that we offer to managers that then leads to other stuff. So, yeah. And talk about fortuitous timing with the Jobs Act happening shortly shortly yeah, after, right? right? In, tw- in twenty twelve, I think you know for listeners, you know, if you're kind of newer to the podcast and haven't heard us talk about the Jobs Act, I mean, this was this is a fundamental shift in how the private markets can now operate. So, do you want to kind of share a little bit, Matt, of just what what that kind of did, and did you did you see or did did you foresee when that came out, like, oh, this is going to be a game changer? Or was it still oh, yeah. like? Okay, yeah, t- tell a little bit of when that happened because you know I was still in school then or just come out of school, so it's you know still fresh to me. But yeah, well, when that that passed in 2012, and then they didn't actually implement it until 2013. Uh, but I knew right when it passed that okay, this is a game changer. I mean, you can now publicly yeah. advertise and solicit, so you're not limited to people with whom you have a prior business relationship. Um, you know, the trade-off was you had to verify the accreditation, which you know the, the it became the managers responsibility to verify the accreditation, whereas in a, in a B or in the old school, they didn't have to verify it. They only had to represent it. Right. So that, right. that early on, that was a big thing. I remember when that first happened, investors were like, well, why do you, you need to prove that I'm, you know, worth, you know, more than a million dollars? Like, why do you need that? We're like, well, because this is a new regulation and <laughs> we want to solicit and advertise, we have to do this. So it was a big deal. Uh, we recognized it immediately. Every, every fund that we've done since 2013 has been a C, um, and we verify the accreditation and follow the safe harbor, you know, guidelines and so forth. But yeah, it's just, and you know, more importantly, even than just, you know, verifying accreditation, it's, it gave rise to crowdfunding, right? It was like all these crowdfunding sites that they, they didn't exist prior to 2013 because it wasn't legal to, to put out there that you were running a fund, to, you know, other than the people that you knew. So yeah, it's fundamentally changed things and it's given rise to, you know, investor portals and crowdfunding sites and all kinds of stuff that, you know, 10 years since people kind of take for granted now, but, but yeah, that's all happened in a very short period of time. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of leads to the next question I wanted to, to ask you and I mean, all the good of being able to now have more access in, you know, really in 2012, it's really spawned this whole new democratization of you know, access to these types of private alternatives, which largely, and we're probably a little biased, right, but are superior in a lot of ways to the public markets where you have less volatility. A lot of times you can achieve better returns. Um, but now the bigger challenge is not necessarily access to deal flow. It's determining, you know, which operators to exactly. invest with and which funds to invest in, right? So now the now the impetus is on the investors to be able to know the basics of due diligence and you know i'm not just investing with uncle jerry who has a couple you know single family homes he's you know doing uh, it's now i'm seeing these ads on facebook and you know it's just a legit operator so from your perspective this is where i really think you can add a lot of value with our listeners is just what are you seeing from the fund management side of this where you've worked now with three or four hundred funds some, I'm sure, very big variants of success around the fundraising. Yep. And, you know, what are some of the kind of key things that separate the good from the bad from the great? And, you know, maybe layer into that because because one of the unique things is, you know, good salesmen may not be good operators, right? That's and vice versa, exactly. good operators may not be good salesmen. And so there's like this constant challenge, right, as, as investors of being able to parse between those two. Yeah, and it, it, I admittedly, Ben, it is not easy for an individual investor to be able to perform the the real appropriate due diligence that they should be doing. Right? It's it's challenging. No, no question about it. Um, I think, look, it, you know, being what I characterize this juncture, you know, professional in, in this, I mean, it's hard enough for us to do due diligence on managers at do deep. <laughs> real due diligence for an individual investor putting 50,000 or a hundred thousand, which is a lot of money to that investor. But in the scheme of things to a manager, you know, that's a relatively small amount. You know, it's, it's hard to balance those two considerations, but I, I think there's very basic due diligence that people can do. You know, and a lot of what, frankly, our company has tried to do is provide some of that for investors, I mean, you can get background checks on managers, ask them if they have track records and verifications. You know, I, I think even just asking questions is helpful in seeing how the managers respond. You know, at the end of the day, there's, I, I think that crowdfunding 
you know, and the Jobs Act has, it, it's like a lot of things in life. I think it cuts both ways. It's provided a lot more uh, access to investors for a lot more variety of stuff all over the country, different asset types, different locations. But part of the trade-offs is, to your point, it's very hard to tell the difference between a charismatic marketer you know, who doesn't know anything about being a good fund manager or a real estate investor, you know, and a high quality real estate investor who might be a terrible marketer, <laughs> right? So I, I won't pretend that it's easy, you, you know, uh, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, what would you say are some of the kind of key distinguishing factors without getting too nitty gritty or, I mean, I, I there's a lot of nuance here, but just obviously track records important, but, um, you know, when, when someone comes to you and say, I want to set up a fund, you know, do you have a gut sense of, Hey, this is probably going to be a success. These guys are legit versus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I, I think, you know, it's, they have a team, the best fund managers, they have a team. It's not usually just one person. They have a team of people in the management entity. And generally speaking, they do, they perform different functions. So like a lot of teams, you have complementary players that each do something you know, different. I think they come in with a plan. They have a specific asset strategy that they, or thesis that they're uh, committed to, and you can really tell their enthusiasm about it, you know, and, and why. Uh, they articulate a strategy for raising capital. So they're not just coming into it blind and have no idea how they're going to, to do that. So I could tell generally pretty quickly who has a pretty good chance of being successful and who's just sort of dreaming. You know that because because a fund is sexy, right? I mean, a lot of for a lot of managers, the idea of setting up a fund and having their own discretionary vehicle that they can use to have the money sitting there, right, is something that they that they want to try to do. But from an investor perspective, I think you know track record, team. You know, if I can get background checks, you know, I I think that's always helpful. They, you know, if managers are willing to provide it, um, you know, what have they done before? How long have they been in the business? What sort of deal velocity do they have? You know, if they're if they're not sure how they're going to originate deals, or they're only doing one or two, they probably shouldn't be setting up a fund. But if they're at a point where they're, you know, raising significant, have they raised money before? You know, from other investors on a syndicated basis, almost always, you know, they need to do that for some time period before jumping straight to a fund. They they really don't want to jump from zero to a fund straight away for the most part. So things like that are are things that we look for initially. And then, you know, part of our business is making seed investments in the manager to help capitalize the fund. And for us to do that, we go through very deep due diligence that is really not practical for, you know, a high net worth investor to be able to do. So I do think that investors sometimes can leverage off of, uh, off of the capability of some managers that they could invest in, uh, you know, and certainly having experience Asking around, knowing somebody that is invested with those people is always, you know, a, an excellent way, you know, to get, and ideally not somebody that the manager provided you, but somebody that, you know, that, you know, that you've got on your own to get the real, the real scoop and, you know, not hand, hand pick. Uh, so those are some of the things that I think can be, can be applied fairly easily for investors. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's great. I think one thing you just said earlier, which is kind of, you know, not even a, a quantitative metric, but just the qualitative of talking with someone on the team and asking the harder question to see how they respond. And, you know, on a previous podcast, you know, we were talking about, you know, what happened recently with CrowdStreet and how they were, you know, a, a big platform raising a ton of money, I think $4 billion of equity they've raised over the past few years. And it's come out now that they actually uh, explicitly excluded um, bad deals from a, a sponsor's track record because they thought it would uh, it was not essential to the investors to to see that yeah. one deal went through bankruptcy and other you know deal was uh, given back to the bank. <laughs> so that's, that's not that's not material. It's it's not material. Yeah. It's yeah. So I mean, yeah, but part of that goes to like ultimately you're only going to see what they're going to show you, and so there has to be a level like you got to ask the right questions, you got to look at the right things, but then ultimately. Like ask them about if if, it, if a manager has been operating for any length of time, they've had a couple deals that didn't go according to plan, right? And if they if you ask them, tell me about the deals that didn't go according to pro forma. What happened? What did you do? And how did you 
you know, mitigate that and rectify it. They say, oh, we haven't had any, any deals go bad. That's, well, that's a red prior. That's prior red flag number one, right? That's but then two, like, are they transparent about it? And are they, you know, sharing about, you know, what they did and Hey, we missed it here, but it was out of our control. And here's what we did to fix that. And we actually did a, you know, a manager loan to, you know, bridge the gap until we got back to stability or whatever it was. Like th those are the kind of things that can really, you know, the, the character of someone is really shown in a challenging situation. And you know, sometimes you can't always get the actual quantitative data you want or maybe withheld, but you can get a, a decent gut sense, I think. So I think just wanted to make that point because I think it's important to, to have those conversations and have a face-to-face you know, -face or at least, a, you know, virtual face-to-face -face with, with the managers. Yeah, I, I think the more that you can talk to the people better, and I do think that... Um, to your point, it's not always, you know, absolute quantitative. It's sometimes you can get a good feeling just by having conversations. So I would encourage investors to talk to talk to people and and talk to others that have done business with them and get a sense of it. Um, you know, that can go a long way. Yeah. One of the things I love to you to kind of share a little bit is just you mentioned funds a lot. Um, so for those that maybe are more familiar with syndications, can you just break down Kind of at a high level, what are the kind of differences between the two, maybe pros and cons of both? Yeah. Yeah. So I would define a syndication as a single asset. So one piece of property or one loan or whatever it is people are investing in, but it's one asset and multiple investors. So typically you're forming, the manager's forming an entity, pulling in money from three, six, 10, 12, 15, 100 investors, but they're, but the per, proceeds of that money are going into only one transaction, right? So that's fairly simple. It, it's complicated in the sense that you have a bunch of investors, but they each own a pro rata share, but it's a single asset, right? A fund is this multiple investors, six, eight, 10, 20, 50, 100, 500 investors, but multiple assets that are being acquired at different points in time. So it's not, the money is all being put into one identifiable asset that the investor can see before they invest in it, there it's it's got, there's multiple assets being bought pursuant to some articulated strategy, right, or box that the investor or that the manager puts in their offering documents, but the investor doesn't know exactly which investments are going to be acquired, right, because they they haven't been acquired yet. They they know what kind of strategy the manager is going to pursue, but they don't know which assets. So and that's that's how people call it a blind pool fund because from the investor's perspective, they're they're buying into, they're buying shares of or investing in an entity that's going to acquire multiple assets at different points in time that they're not clear on what those are. Right. And so that's how I would characterize the difference between a fund and a syndication. You know, as to which is I always tell people neither is better than the other inherently, right? Some sometimes a syndication is fine for certain instances and sometimes a fund is fine, but they have basic differences that that are important for people to understand. And there's and there's pluses and minuses, pros and cons to each. And from an investor perspective, I always encourage people to be really clear on what your objectives are going in, right? Because that may influence whether you choose to invest in a fund or a syndication. Do you want diversity? Are you looking for concentration? Do you want income? Do you want growth? Are you looking for tax benefits? Right? Do you want to know what you're investing in specifically? You know, or are you content to pick, you know, a jockey and then let them run without knowing exactly, you know, where, where they're going to run to. So, uh, again, not, neither is better than the other. Apparently they're different. They each have their pros and cons. Yes. As a, if I was coming from the investor's perspective, you know, it's one thing if somebody new to the game comes and says, look, I've, I've got this, let's just say in the apartment world, I've got this fantastic asset tied up put together a pro forma and all want to raise some money. I want to do a syndication as an investor. I might look at that person and say, okay, I can, I can overlook or I can factor in the inexperience. Maybe it's the first or second rodeo, but that's the asset. So at the end of the day, at least I know what we've acquired. Well, whereas as a fund, you know, it's like, Hey, let's go do apartments, you know, let's go do value at apartments. And I've never done one yet, but I've been to some classes and it looks really good. You know, we have a kick butt team and know how to raise all kinds of money. To me, that's a bug looking for multiple windshields. You know, I would think that, you know, investing in a fund is where experience 
uh, and not even just necessarily experience at, at doing deal after deal after deal, because there's a whole operational aspect and executionary aspect to it that, you know, and, and even things like, can you trust the person to make as good of acquisitions as he would have if he only had the money to buy one, you know? So, you know, address that. What, what do you see there? Yeah, well, those, those are all absolutely on on point uh observations jim i mean it, you know there's and there's an infinite number of things like that right so i would say managers to part of your question earlier ben managers that tend to make good syndicators i would say the typical progression is people start off on a syndication they do deals a lot of time and eventually they reach a point where it becomes operationally inefficient to try to raise money one deal at a time because you got to create an offering document every time. You've got a tight timeline to close, right? And if you're doing any volume of that, it becomes very inefficient. So raising, doing it in a fund can be much more efficient and effective for a manager, but it comes along with it, come a lot of other operational requirements that the syndicators don't necessarily, they haven't adopted yet. So people need to learn. So to Jim's point, I think, you, you know, certain people, you need a certain level of sophistication and and size and understanding of what it's going to be like in order to be effective and and as a fund manager and it i mean the two words i use the most are character and competence right you, character is like the absolute foundation you have to have people who who fundamentally view themselves as stewards of other people's money so that they don't they're not likely to go out and just start making dumb decisions because Frankly, they can, you know, they the investor doesn't really see what's going on most of the time. And so they're relying very heavily on the character of that manager. And if, you know, how do you judge character from somebody you've never met before? Right. It's very hard. Uh, but I, if you do it and you pick the manager wisely, there's a lot of advantages to investors. They don't necessarily have to pick and choose. Some people just don't want to re spend time reviewing all those documents or they don't even have the expertise to do it in the first place, you know, or when they get the money back from the deal that paid off, they don't want to have to run, turn around and do it again. They're content to just, you know, let it ride. So there's all these reasons that, that would drive people from one to the other. But to Jim's point, you know, not every manager is cut out to be a fund manager. In fact, I'd say the subset of total syndicators who really make good fund managers is, you know, it's, it's not 80 or 90%, you know, it's probably more like 10 or 20. Yeah, I mean, to your earlier point at the at the fund, now you have created. If you're raising a lot of money, that's great. But now you've created an additional problem of, well, you've got to go and invest that money. And if you don't have great deal flow, right, and if you haven't identified a really tight strategy in what you're doing, you could actually be incentivized, you know, maybe unknowingly, but just have the feeling of I have all this cash, I got to go deploy, and now I'm going to go and just maybe bid on assets that, you know, are overpriced because I just have to you know, deploy this capital. And so if you're inexperienced, if you don't have the deal flow, if you haven't managed, you know, that kind of you know, chicken and egg scenario at a larger scale, it, it can be, um, can be not good, right. From a, a capital standpoint. And you think about incentives, right? I mean, if they're going to earn their management fee, they need to get the money out. So are they incentivized yeah. to get the money back? I mean, I've seen plenty of really good quality managers that just say they didn't have the deal. They give the money back where they never deployed it in the first place. Right. But how, do, how does one do that? If, if that's the primary source of revenue that pays their bills or allows them to yeah what so i'd say another characteristic then would be good fund managers most of the time they have another operating business that yeah you know, fundamentally pays their bills and they're not reliant solely on the fund management fees to exist right because if they are then you know, these distant centers or these la lack of aligned descent incentives can definitely play, you know, against the investor's state. Right. So, you all, yeah, and, and no, that's a, that's a really big deal. You just said there, I mean, a, it's a really interesting situation because you're, you know, you're, you're managing, you know, back to Ben's, you know, chicken and egg uh, point It's you know, you don't want to be sitting on cap too much capital for too long because your, your IRR goes down the tubes for your investors, but you also don't want to, spend everything you got just because you need to earn the fees or you got to do deals. And now your now your quality of deal analysis goes down the tube. So it really does take a, a level of, you said it, of, of sophistication. And we live in an interesting time when, 
you know, you can, you can get online and find a thousand experts at showing you how to become the most popular face on any platform, pick your platform and, and which usually can correlate into making sales or raising, raising money from the maybe less educated people. And, um, but how many are there on, on, you know, and, and, and can you even learn how to be a good operator without some bumps and bruises and years of experience? I, I think, I think the right kind of person can learn to be an operator out of the gate and how to do some things right. But, you know, wh where are all the courses on how to be a, a good seasoned, honest, integrous operator with character and, and competence, you know, <laughs> there's not very many of them. I try to put on as much, you know, educational material as possible, but you don't see all that much of it. You know, and to your point too, man, it's like when the crowdfunding stuff came out, it was like a lot of these crowdfunding sites who shall remain nameless, right? They would brag about the fact that these deals would show up in like, in what, 30 seconds or, or a minute or two. Right. How is an investor supposed to do any due diligence in two right. when the whole game is that they're right. going to like click invest as fast as they possibly can so that the deal doesn't fill up? And then what are these investors? It, 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 the problem, too, is that the number one thing they're looking at is what's the IRR? Right. And yep. you guys know as well yep. as I do, a manager can put out any number for an IRR. Right. So the incentive then is to put the highest number you possibly can because they know that that's what's going to drive the clicks. Right. And get the people to click as fast as they can without doing any homework or due diligence. Like that's just a totally messed up system. It is. You know? And yet that, that is the way that it worked for, you know, in study of the heyday, you know, from the mid to late teens all the way up through, you know, 20, 21, 22. That's, that's how it worked. You know, now it's finally getting to the point where, okay, people are, you know, not treating it that way. And they're waking up to see that, you know, that was just a dumb idea in the first place. But it's kind of uh, aggravating because, you know, it's, it's the, the reason we have, I mean, we, we need regulation. Like we all, I think we all would agree to that, but we also probably would all agree that regulations can be onerous and usually are, and they punish all the wrong people, but it's, it's that's exactly just, what? it's exactly what you just described, what, which, I, I mean, there's gotta be regulators foaming at the mouth, looking at the crowd street thing and looking at, you know, all of that kind of thing you described, you know, and saying, man, we ought to, we ought to be we ought to be regulating this industry a little more. We have all these people out raising money. Wait a second, stop. But the, the hard part, Jim, is that to exactly to your point is like the regulations end up penalizing the people who are fundamentally honest and fundamentally feel compelled to try to attempt to comply with the regulation, mm -hmm. which then only exacerbates the operational you know, burdens and costs on the, those people. And then the people who really don't care about the regulations or who just flat out ignore them, right, are the ones who end up raising the most money, which was super frustrating, you know. Well, let's just go find them all and beat them up. That's what I say. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think like for the investors listening to all of this, it's kind of like, well, what do they do, right? If you're in an environment where people are chasing yield and, and deals are filling up super fast, it's kind of like you feel like, hey, if I want to get on the game, I got to move super quick and I need to compromise all the standards I should be adhering to to actually try to underwrite the deal. I mean, that's frustrating, right? But but yeah. really, they should not fall prey to that and they should take their time and they should do some homework on whatever they're investing in and they should walk away from the deal if the pressure to invest inside of seconds or minutes is so great that, right, that forces them to try to do that. But, you know, the humans are, you know, we're, people follow the hurt and, and like, it's, as you guys well know, it's, and like right now what's happening is, I mean, I see some really fantastic investments that people don't want to do because they're afraid. Is it, but what right. about right? Is like be greedy when <laughs> others are afraid and then be afraid when others are greedy. That That's great advice, but it's very hard for the average person. <laughs> do it here. FOMO is a real thing, isn't it? It yeah. is. It, it's it not is. a good, it's, it's really not a good, uh, you know, Funnel point for evaluating your your investments. You know it's how much fairer is motivated. But 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 you know good capital raisers and you know uh, charismatic marketers understand FOMO and they use it to their advantage. Yeah. Now I I think those are really really incredible points. Um, one thing I'd love to just kind of round it out here with is, yeah, you, know, you talk about alignment of interest. You talked about you know what are the incentives, right? And I always talk about 
when you're reviewing PPM, these things can be, they can feel a little bit overwhelming if you've not read them before. They can be a hundred pages long. It's all this legalese. What should I focus on? Well, the place I always go to first are the fee section and the waterfall section, right? Because it gives you a really good sense of what's the alignment of interest and what are the way or the incentives that the manager has in this particular fund or syndication. So can you talk about from the past investor standpoint, what are some maybe like yellow flags? Like if you're reviewing, you know, a PPM and you're looking at the waterfall and this seems to be a little bit off and you, I mean, I'm sure you've reviewed a thousand of these. So oh, yeah. well, we got a pretty good sense of things that, you know, are, are good and things that we should just at least ask questions more on. Right. So could you just give some of those highlights if you, if you have some, top of your head yeah i i, I agree with you that and there's there's four sections i would look at what what is what are the assets they're investing in the, the investment strategy and fundamentally is that sure do it does that you know resonate with me like the the bios and the experience of the manager who are these people how long have they been doing it what have they been doing the fees and the fees and waterfalls like what fees are they charging and the waterfalls and so forth and then the risk factors and the risk factors yeah. are going to be 40 pages long and it's everything under the sun you know, and so forth. But if, if I know who they are and I know what they've done, I know what their investment strategy is, the fees are reasonable, that's a great place to start, right? And so to to your point, I think, you know, it, I've seen PPMs where the manager can kind of do anything and everything under the sun. So that's that's always a red flag to me when the manager can just do anything they possibly want to, right? And they don't have a, a fairly defined, you know, box. And that's always an issue for a manager. How tight do you make that box, right? Because I might right. want to do that might want to do that. And if you make it too tight, I'm going to miss out on deals I might otherwise do, right? But if you make it too broad, then the investor has no idea what the manager's man, you know, investing at. And I've seen some PPMs from places that I've watched blown up where they could put on do all kinds of things that they shouldn't be doing, including, you know, appointing themselves managers of the, the things that they're doing, you know, or investing in and then paying themselves fees to do it in undefined amounts. I mean, those are just crazy things. So I think an investor should also learn what what are I get this question all the time. What are normal fees, right? What is the range of fees that what fees should I expect a manager to charge, and what is a range of what's normal, what's good, what's bad? So an investor should familiarize themselves with that, in my opinion. You know, and those are going to vary asset management fees, points if it's a loan based, you know, or a loan strategy, fund management fee, construction and development override fees, you know. Acquisition fee, disposition fee, you know, property management fees. You know, how much fees should a manager be charging, and, and shouldn't they charge? Now, that's something an investor, I think, needs to familiarize themselves. Because so, if I can look at the manager, the strategy, and the fees, that I can go eighty percent of the way toward, you know, yes, I want to spend more time looking at this, or no, I don't, just off of that. Yeah, no, I think that's really good, really, really good advice. And you know, for for me, you know, I've talked about this before, but one of the the quickest proxies to just get a good sense of alignment of interest is skin of the game, right? How much are the general partners putting in as LP capital, right? Right alongside you on the same waterfall and how much of their own personal capital they put it in. Cause that's a pretty good, you know, proxy for they believe in the strategy, believe in the offering and are putting their own capital at risk. They have something to lose now if things don't, don't go according to plan. Um, but I, I love that. That's, that's really, really helpful. So, Matt, what, what's the best way? I know you kind of serve, uh, you know, fund managers. It's kind of your core business. I mean, you have kind of legacy real estate funds. Um, you know, for those that are kind of curious on, on either side of those, what's what's kind of the best way to learn more about what you're doing and just the companies that you you run? Yeah, I think uh, LinkedIn is probably my <laughs> best spot. If people want to find you know public uh, information, social media is LinkedIn is where I'm most active. Um, the company FairwayAmerica.com. Uh, and you can learn more about the company there. The other one is Veribest, V-E-R-I-B-E-S-T uh, dot com. Uh, and either of those can give you information about the company and, and has my has my contact information. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I definitely got a lot out of it. I'm sure our listeners uh, will as well. So thanks for sharing all your wisdom. That's, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you guys having me very much. Thanks, Matt. Have a great one.